the Jews have never totally, they're some, but mostly the Jewish nation has never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They never believed that he was God's son, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world, and that he shed his blood so that we could be redeemed. Most Jewish people do not adhere to that. So when they build this new temple, they're going to go back to the Old Testament ways. They're going to go back to the sacrificing of animals and doing that in worship to God. So when these two guys come and they stand in the courtyard of the temple, and they begin, they begin to proclaim the word of God and teach that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he came to, sin, to this earth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for the sins of the world, rose the third day, ascended to heaven, and that he is coming back. And by that time, he has come back. It's going to, as you would say, ruffle a few feathers, would you not think? Yeah. Just as in the days of the disciples after Jesus died, and rose again and then ascended into heaven. The Bible says they were always after them, always trying to silence them, always trying to, to kill them, to put them in prison, to put them to, that's what Saul did before he became Paul. He persecuted the church. Well, these two guys are going to come out and they're going to preach the word of God. They're going to preach that grace, it's by God's grace that we are saved through our faith, through Jesus Christ. And according to the word of God, they will be hated. Let me, let me give you something for today. We live in a world today where if I stood here as a pastor, as a preacher, and I just preached to you, you guys are okay. You guys are sweet. If you have good thoughts, you're good and you all go to heaven. If you treat people nice, that's all you got to do. And then God will love you when you show God's love to everybody else. And you'll all be sweet and nice and go to heaven. And you'll have no more heartache. You'll have no more pain. And everything's going to be this peachy king between here and glory. I could grow the church like you would not believe if I would preach that way. But according to my Bible, my Bible says this. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible tells me that we all have fallen short of the glory of God, that we're all sinners. The Bible teaches you and me that even on our best day, our righteousness is as that filthy rights. Now, we discussed all that last week, so, or the week before, so we're not going to go back there again. But I want to tell you this. The world out there today does not want to hear old-fashioned preaching that says sin is still sin in the sight of God, and that you need to get in an altar and get right with God and have your sins washed away that you must go through them by Jesus and Jesus alone. There is no other way. There's not many ways to heaven. I know Oprah Winfrey thinks that there's several ways to heaven, but according to the word of God, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. And when we preach that kind of word in this world today, there's a lot of people that don't want to hear it because we're closed-minded. Because we're close-minded that we are not woke to accept everything that goes on in this world. I still believe that God is against homosexuals and adulterers and murders and abortion crowd. You say, well, preacher, that's not popular preaching. Exactly. And that's exactly what happens in this day. Now, I want you, I'm going way ahead of what I've got in my notes, and it don't matter. Notes are just notes. I just wrote them. I want to give you what I think. Think about this. We live in a world today where Christians, those who have placed their faith and trust in God, are still here. Now, according to the Word of God, and you see it in these guys, and you see it throughout all the Scripture, if you're in the will of God, doing the will of God, and God's got His hand on you, there ain't no power on earth that can touch you, that can stop you, that can harm you, unless God says otherwise. None. None. These guys preach for three and one half years the word of God to a lost and dying world. Can't be stopped. Can't be touched. We see in the coming scriptures that if anybody tries to harm them, that they just open their mouth and fire comes out and devours them. Hey, sometimes I wish as a preacher I had that power, amen. <laughs> you don't like it? I just eat some garlic and onions and it'll do the same thing. It'll run everybody away. But these guys can't be touched. It's the same thing with you and me. As long as we're doing the will of God and the work of God, I'm telling you, 
Satan, and the world cannot stop you. These guys come and they preach God's word. We have the Holy Ghost with us too today. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all pray for the world situation? I mean, maybe not every day, but quite often. You pray for what's happening in this world. You pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven according to the word of God. How many of y'all spend a little bit of time praying for the crime that's going on in this land? How many of y'all saw this week? I might get the ages wrong, so if I do, forgive me, but I believe it was a 12-year-old girl was on a bus and two boys beat the daylights out of this girl while nobody intervened, nobody helped, the bus driver didn't help, no one else helped, and they all held up their phones and just took pictures of it as they beat this girl even after her mother had already complained to the principal that she was being bullied and who'd they blame it on? The mama. She should have took her out of school. We live in this society today where people will kill you just because you look at them wrong. How many of y'all ever pull out in front of somebody on accident, didn't mean to, and man, they give you some gesture with the hand, and it's not this <laughs> or that, I mean. And they say, bah, 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 as they go by. I mean, people are getting evil. But we live in a world today where Christians are here, where the Holy Spirit is here. We live in a world where people that call on God pray to God and ask God to intervene in the lives of people on this earth. Ask God to intervene with the, with the meanness and the cruelty and the anger that's going on in this world. We're praying for that. You have men that stand in a pulpit and proclaim the word of God without worry about what anybody else thinks. Just realizing I have to stand before God one day for what I preach and I've got to proclaim the word of God as God gives it to me, Amen. whether people like it or not. Right. We still have that today. Think about this day. When these two guys come, there is no church here anymore. There's no people praying for this world. There's no Holy Spirit because when the church checks out, the Holy Spirit's going with us. There is no Bible preacher. I personally believe this. Now, I got no proof on this, but I personally believe that during the tribulation period, the Bible will be outlawed. And the Bible, there will be no product, no more new Bibles. And if they do produce a Bible, it will be some worldly Bible that is not true, and it will be produced, if any at all. So there's no word of God to preach, and what preaching will take place will not have the power and the unction of the Holy Spirit behind it. So we think it's bad today? What do you think about then? When these two guys stand up and proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ that died on the cross for the sins of the world, people are going to hate them even way more than they do today. They're going to despise them. They're going to hate them. They're going to look at them and just say, shut up. And people will try to kill them. People will try to stop them. They're going to come in there with guns and weapons and they're going to pow, disintegrate them with fire that comes down from their mouth. So we got to realize that where these guys are at this time prophesying for the word of God, it's, it's going to be way worse than it is today. Now, who could these guys be? Now, you'll find a lot of people say they believe it to be Elijah and Enoch. Now, you might say, Elijah and Enoch? Why would it be Elijah and Enoch? Well, think about it. Let me ask you a question. What two men in the Bible, according to the Word of God, never died?
the book of Malachi, the fourth chapter, I believe it's verse 4 and verse 5, the Bible mentions Moses in verse 4. And in verse 5 it says, And God will send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. What two men appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 with Jesus Christ? Moses and Elijah. So, that's my opinion. Alright, let's give it another thing. What did Elijah pray? I think it's in the, it's either 1 Kings chapter 10, 1 Kings chapter 7, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly. But Elijah, the Bible says, prayed that the heavens would shut up and it would not rain. And it did not rain. What happens here? The Bible says that in verse number 3, it says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand. A thousand two hundred three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks will come back to that in a minute, standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, the fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoured the enemies. And if any man hurt them, they must die. They must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power to open uh, to over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So Elijah prays and it doesn't rain. Here the Bible says these two prophets are going to come out, preach the word of God, and they will prophesy and it will not rain. Also the Bible says that during these two prophets ministry, while here on this earth, that they will send plagues upon the earth. Let me ask you, who did the plagues in the Ten Commandments? And it ain't Charlton Heston, okay? It's Moses. Moses, now Moses didn't do the plagues. Moses just called on God and God sent the plagues. Same thing will be here. It won't be the power of these guys that, that stop the rain. It won't be these guys' power that sends the plagues, turns the rivers into blood. But it will be through them that God works his miracle power. So I personally believe that it would be Moses and Elijah. But who it is doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter exactly what day they come or what part of the tribulation they come. They will come and they will prophesy and they will teach and they will preach God's holy word to a dark, dark, dark lost world. So their ministry. But then we see the massacre of these guys. Now, like I said, they're hated. They're desperately hated. You know, you should... If you go back in the 60s and 70s, and even the 80s, even people who wasn't saved, even people who did not go to church, they had a lot of love and respect for Billy Graham. Because Billy Graham went through crusades from city to city to city preaching the word of God. And whether you was a Christian or not, they respected him. The respect of preachers and pastors and churches these days is just about gone out the door. Mm -hmm. People don't respect it. And I tell you, and the church has brought a lot of that, and pastors have brought a lot of that on themselves because of their sinfulness and wrongdoing and the fight and the fussing that goes on in churches has brought disgrace upon the name of God. But these two guys are going to be desperately hated. Listen to this, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, now after they're done prophesying what God gives them, when they're done doing what God told them to do, the Bible says, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. Now, I will tell you, during the book of Revelation, we're going to see 38 times that the Antichrist is referred to as the beast. So that's who this is. It's the Antichrist that comes out of the bottomless pit he shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie on the, in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Gomorrah, or Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. So we know that it's speaking of the great city. Anytime, most every time you read in the Bible the great city, it's speaking of Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was crucified. That's where he died for your sins and mine. It is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Why? Because of the idols worship. Because of the sinfulness. Because these people had turned against God, denied Jesus Christ, and that's why they're called that. But it says that the Antichrist is going to come out, make war with them, and go to kill them. And their bodies are going to lie in the streets of the great city for three and a half days. 
suffer their bodies to be put in the graves, and they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. simply proclaiming God's word. They're simply preaching what thus saith the Lord. The people hate them. People despise them. They were tormented by these words. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever witnessed to somebody who's lost and you began to tell them about Jesus? I don't want to hear it. You ever heard, you ever heard those words? I don't need your Jesus stuff. I don't need your Bible stuff. I don't need your church. You church people are just a bunch of weaklings. You've got to lean on Jesus. Praise God. Thank God we got Jesus to lean on. Amen. But they get very defensive sometimes. I've seen it. I had guys when I was in the Navy and I tried to witness to them about the goodness of God and the Bible. I mean, they'd almost be ready to put up fists and fight just because you tried to tell them about Jesus. Well, here the Bible says these people are tormented for three and a half years when these guys preach Jesus, Jesus, Jesus to them. They say, oh, I don't want to hear it no more. And when the Antichrist kills them, the word of God says their bodies will lie in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. And every tongue, nation, kindred of people are going to rejoice. They're going to celebrate. These two guys are finally dead. Finally shut them up. Praise the Antichrist. That's what they're going to do. They're going to praise the Antichrist because he's the one that killed them. And they're going to have parties. And they're going to celebrate. And it's going to be like Christmas. The Bible says they will send gifts one to another. That's weird, folks. But that's the way they're, that's the way the, and the world, we, can you not see the world we live in today going in that very direction yes. right now? Because I want to tell you something. When these guys die, there's going to be a party worldwide. Can I give you another guarantee? When Jesus Christ steps up on the cloud with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and calls the church home to be with him, there's going to be a party on this earth. Woo! Those Christians are finally gone. We don't have to hear no more about Jesus and him dying. They're going to celebrate. But they're going to celebrate big time when these guys die. They're going to leave them in the street three and a half days. The whole world. You know, you go back 50, 60 years ago, it would have been impossible in Elkin, Jonesville, and this area, Wilkes, Surrey, Yakin County, it would have been impossible for us to see what was happening in downtown Jerusalem. It would have taken weeks for that to get to us. Today, it takes approximately eight seconds for news to happen in Jerusalem and get to your TV or your cell phone. About eight seconds. That's all the delay there is. So when this happens, the world's going to be tuning in. They're going to be calling each other. Hey, turn it over to CNN. Turn it over to Fox News. Look what's happening. They're dead. And they're going to be thrilled. They're going to be happy. They're going to throw parties. But the parties don't last long. Well, three and a half days. Can you just imagine? They're going to watch them as they lie in the streets. Their bodies are going to begin to set in with rigor mortis. They will probably swell up. I mean, how many of y'all will see a deer killed on the side of the road? And a couple of days later, it's twice the size because it begins to swell. That's what happens to bodies when they die. And so their bodies are going to begin to swell and, and they'll be turning colors and looking really ugly. But people's going to be watching their TVs, partying and drinking and having a good old time celebrating. But then the next verse says, and it says the Spirit of God but that word, the spirit of life that comes from it, it says in the original writings, it's the breath of God. The same breath that God breathed into uh, Adam, the breath of life, will breathe into them. Now, imagine. You're sitting there partying, drinking, living it up, all so thrilled because they're dead, and all 
of a sudden you see one of them go. And then go, hey, what you doing? This thing back getting up. And they start watching these two guys come back to life. And the Bible says, great fear fell upon them. It's like the, if you was at a funeral service, somebody died a few days ago, and we come into the church, and their coffin's sitting here, and you walk up, and if I know them very closely, know them very dearly, a lot of times I'll touch them. Now, if I don't know them that well, I don't. I reach over and I touch their hand. But what if they moved? <laughs> Just like Jennifer just did. <laughs> you jump out of your skin. You'd be like, whoa, what was that? I just watched a video the other day on, on Facebook. It was practical pranks that husbands and wives was pulling on each other. And this husband pulled one on his wife because she had scared the daylights out of him weeks before. So he worked it up with his friends and everything that somebody had died that hadn't really died. Put him in a casket brought her into the funeral home and she's sitting there and she's like, Ooh, again. she reaches over, by the time she reaches over, he just sets up and she screamed and ran out of that place. That was funny to watch. It wouldn't be funny to go through. Chelsea's like, no, no. But these guys are going to stand up in the streets of Jerusalem and worldwide through cameras and TVs are going to see it and people who are partying and celebrating and sending gifts are going to stop and go, they're alive. They're back. Just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. <laughs> they're back. And they're scared. Why would it bring fear to their Why It says great fear. Why would it bring great fear? Number one, it proves that God is in control. Number two, it proves they were sent by God as God's messengers to deliver the word of God. Three, if what they were saying is true, we are in really big trouble. And it brought great fear upon their hearts and in their lives. They were absolutely terrified because these two guys got up. But that wasn't all. The Bible says, after verse 10, after they all rejoice because of this, the Bible says in verse 11, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life entered into them. They stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. And they heard a great voice. You're already listening to the underline the grace. There's great fear. There's a great voice from heaven saying to them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. I believe here God has just given them another, I told you so, and you wouldn't listen. We preach the rapture of the church today. We preach that one of these days Jesus Christ will step out on a cloud with the voice of our dance, trump of God, and call the church home to be with them. We preach that, and people laugh at us. Laugh at us. They scorn us. They think we're crazy, some pie-in-the-sky doctrine. Oh, you guys are idiots believing that kind of stuff. I'm here to tell you, one of these days, it's going to happen, and the world will be like, what just happened? What? And where did they all go? They ain't going to know where we went. They ain't going to be able to figure it out. I believe, and then you go to Revelation chapter 4. The Bible says that John said, after the age of the church, after the Gentile age of the church, the Bible says, and there was a trumpet that come from heaven and he's called up into the glory and he, the first thing he sees is the throne of God in heaven. These guys are going to be, once again, raptured out of this world for all the world to see. The Bible says their enemies beheld them. They're going to watch them go up and they're going to sit there, Tony, and they're going to shake in fear saying, them boys were the real deal. What they said was truth. And it's going to bring fear into the people's hearts that they're going to shake. But that's not it. That's not all. Then the Bible says, after they go to the heaven, the Bible says, verse 13, and the same hour was there a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. 
in the clouds. When they disappear in the clouds, there's going to be an earthquake in Jerusalem. It's going to shake that place. And when it does, the Bible says a tenth of the city of Jerusalem will be brought down to ashes. And 7,000 people will lose their life when that takes place. But the Bible ends and it says that there was a remnant. I'll tell you something, folks. There is now, there always has been, and there always will be a remnant of people who believe God, believe in His Word, and put their faith and their trust in God and Jesus Christ. Even when the church is raptured out, even when you and I are gone and we're in glory, there will be a remnant of people on this earth that will come to saving knowledge. We've already studied it. We'll go back into them in a week or two. The 144,000 Jews that God puts his seal on that goes out and preaches and teaches Jesus. I'm telling you, there will be people on this earth. This, Bible, this verse says right here, the remnant was afraid, they were frightened, and they gave glory to God. I personally believe this. There will be a lot of Jewish people that's going to walk by these two witnesses and they're going to hear them preach every day, day after day after day, you must be saved. You must have Jesus in your heart. You must be born again. And they're going to preach Jesus over and, over, and these crowds are going to go by every day. And they're going to hear that. And they may walk by and say, I don't need it, don't want it, don't believe it. But when they see what takes place here, they're going to say, them boys were telling the truth. And they're going to bow their head and bow their knees before God, repent of their sins, and ask Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. I believe that will happen, and multitudes will get saved, not just in Israel, but worldwide, because of these two witnesses. I've heard it said millions and millions, and nobody even knows the number of how many people were saved during the lifetime of Billy Graham and his ministry. Millions. But I've also heard since his death that millions have still been saved watching some of the old videos, some of the old revivals that he was in. Just because he's gone doesn't mean that the word of God is still not being spread by Billy Graham. And it is. Now here's the deal. The only people that's going to be here during this are people who miss the rapture. And you only miss the rapture if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And I know I've, I, I preach this and preach this and preach this through Revelation, but God's told me to tell you at least one more time. Just because you come to church doesn't make you a Christian. Amen. Just because you carry a Bible does not make you a Christian. Just because you go through baptismal waters does not make you a Christian. You can go in a dry center and come up a wet center. Just because you say, well, I had an experience when I was in vacation Bible school years ago. I believe I'm saved, preacher. I'll tell you something. Just because you believe the Word of God does not make you a Christian. We preached this a couple weeks ago. The devil believes. The Bible says the devil knows that Jesus is the Son of God. He knows that he's been here through all eternity and always with. He knows what you and I think, what you and I believe. The devil knows it. So if you're not saved and the rapture takes place in five minutes, you will be left behind. And as I preached and preached and preached, if you go into 2 Corinthians, the Bible tells us, and you will believe a lie that God will send a delusion and you will believe the lie of the Antichrist and the lie of the devil and you say, well, no, I'll get saved. And, oh, no, you won't. <clears throat> because the Bible says you have rejected God, you've rejected Christ, and he will send you a strong delusion that you will believe a lie. So today's the day. Today's your opportunity. If you're here today and you, you say, well, preacher, I'm pretty sure I'm saved. I wouldn't walk out the doors unless I knew for certain that Amen. I am saved. I would not leave. I would not put my head on my pillow tonight and go to sleep unless I know that I know that I know that I'm saved, born again, and on my way to heaven. How can you be that way, preacher? How can you know for sure? Nobody as big as God can live in your heart and you not know it. When God moves in, let me tell you, when God moves in, things don't get great. When God moves in and saves you, life doesn't all of a sudden become sunshine and roses. 
It ain't like walking through, you remember Tiny Tim tiptoed through the tulips? That ain't what happens. If, that, if, if, if everything got better, if all your problems went away, if everything got great, when you got saved, everybody would say, man, I want that. It doesn't. Matter of fact, how many can confess? It sometimes gets worse. Amen. Because the devil fights you tooth and nail. He doesn't like the fact that you got saved. He can't do nothing about the fact that you got saved. So what's he do? He torments you to make you miserable so you would say, I ain't going to live like this no more and go back to living the way you was. But the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. It changes you from the inside out. It's like the, the Incredible Hulk. It's a metamorphosis that takes place. It starts on the inside and it works its way out. You don't all of a sudden become an angel. You don't all of a sudden become a saint that, oh, that does everything great. You still mess up. You still fall short of the glory of God. But when you do, what do you do? You ask God for forgiveness. And if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you've got to know that you're saved. I'll tell you. I watch what's happening in the news and I see what's happening. You know, I'm just going to bring it up. To show you how dumb America has gotten, they let a Russian spy balloon fly from Alaska all the way across over Air Force bases and missile silo bases, all the way over it, waited till it got over in the Atlantic Ocean in South, South Carolina, the Surfside Beach, South Carolina. Then they shot it down. What good did that do? Shoot it down after it done done what they wanted it to do. And when we see all the crime that's happening, Folks, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around us and see that the end is near. I watched a YouTube video the other day. Pastor, I'm pretty sure he's a pastor. Very theological, very brilliant man. Loves the Word of God. Talking about the last... He, he said, I believe with all my heart that America will implode from within. He said, America is already... We, you can already see the crumbling of the foundations in the United States of America. He said, and it is getting worse and worse every single day. He believes the only thing holding America together, and I agree, I preached it. He said, the only thing that's holding America together is the glue of Christians that are in this world today. He said, and when you take the Christians, the church, and the Holy Spirit out, it will fall and implode. You say, why do you get in prophecy? There is zero mention of the United States as a country or anything in the Word of God. None in the last days. I do not believe America will be here much longer. I don't believe the church will be here much longer. So I'm asking you this. If you died today, are you sure that you'd go to heaven? Would you stand and bow your heads with me?